This is the Jedberg Podcast. I'm the host, Fran Ricciopi. Each episode, I speak with transformative leaders, visionaries, drivers of change, and those dedicated to winning, no matter the challenge. The Jedberg Podcast is founded in the lineage of the special operations Jedberg teams of the past and is sponsored by the Talent War Group. A percentage of all proceeds is dedicated to the Special Operations Warrior Foundation. I'm a challenger or an investigator, but I can also be a helper. But maybe even at times, I'm an enthusiast or a peacemaker. In this episode, psychotherapist Drew Newkirk dissected the Enneagram theory of personality assessments and how leaders can apply this to their teams. Drew explained the importance of self-awareness in our relationships with others and how the Enneagram helps him deal with his envy of Hugh Jackman. We discussed his docuseries, Songs That Saved Your Life, the importance of music in our mental, physical, and emotional well-being, and how despite early support from even the largest record labels, he still pushes every day to launch the show. We also lamented on his pre-COVID investments in the restaurant industry after an ill-timed rebalance out of tech stocks. But Drew says the loss was worth every penny because of his love for hosting. True Newkirk is a psychotherapist in the West Village in New York City, where he consults with high-functioning and elite performers. Drew uses the Enneagram theory to classify behavioral patterns according to one of nine types. He also uses music to connect with his clients as well as to inspire himself and others. Drew has spent the last seven years developing the concept and producing a docuseries in partnership with recording artist Daryl McDaniels. Songs That Saved Your Life explores music as inspiration to those who have found solace in specific songs. Drew is also an avid restaurateur, investing in New York City bars and restaurants where he explores the inner workings of the food, beverage, and hospitality industries. Drew, welcome to the Jedberg Podcast. What's up, man? Before we start, I need to let all of our listeners know what's going on here kind of on the video screen that they can't see because it's a recording. But for you, we have this guy who you got to be about 6'4", 6'5", maybe 220. Okay. You have sleeve tattoos, shaved head, you know, on the sides, long hair on the top and a beard. And then there's me, right? Clean shaven, short hair, glasses. And when I think about this conversation, you have a green beret talking to a psychotherapist. But when you look at us, I think it should be reversed. I like how you describe me. One, I'm not 6'4". <laughs> I'm, I'm pushing 6'1". I'm devastatingly handsome. So you did not mention that, which really upsets me, <laughs> which should be the most intimidating part for you. I'm about 190 because I've gone with sleek lately more than buff. Because, you know, I'm older now and I don't need to, you don't need really to be that big prove my, my brute strength or my masculinity. <laughs> Now it's about having abs that you can see. It's really the most important thing. And being able to run possibly a six-minute mile when I need to. You don't bounce the bench press bar off your chest anymore? It's all machines, man. I, I do not go, I don't go near free weights. No, too My old. joints don't work the same way. No, it hurts now when you do that. So I got to say, we first met a couple of years ago in one of your bars, actually, down in the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And in which I, you interpreted me as 6'4 then? I think so, yeah. <laughs> you remember, I must have had so much of an impact that you made me taller, bigger, and again, should have made me more handsome. I, I was intimidated, for sure. But I was fascinated by your story because when we spoke, and you reiterated it when we connected again a few weeks ago, you described yourself as a jack of all trades, but master of none. And mm. that really resonated with me because I think about all these things that you're involved in. I mean, you're a psychotherapist to influential people in Manhattan. You're a restaurateur. You're an entrepreneur and, and a film producer trying to launch this startup docuseries. Music is one of your passions that is ingrained in everything that you do. And then as I think about this podcast and I think about the Jedbergs who were recruited across all of the military for a specific set of character traits and skills, but the totality of what they brought to the organization was what made them so successful in anything that they did. I really think about you and I'm like, this is a modern day Jedberg right here. I'll take that. <laughs> That's the <laughs> offset of getting you about 30 pounds above where you are. So I'm going to build you back up. I broke you down a little, now I have to build it back up. And so I'm thinking about trying to tell your story, right? And I know that in journalism, right, they tell you, okay, well, you got to put the bottom line up front. And then in storytelling, they say, 
tease the bottom line out throughout the whole thing and then save the best part for the end. And, but there's so many places that we can begin this conversation and really start talking about you, the things you're involved in. And so I feel like if it's at all possible, we're going to end up trying to do both of these. We're going to put the bottom line up front, but we're also going to talk about all these things at different times. And normally when I start these podcasts, I do it with a discussion about what my guest has achieved. But actually with you, I want to go deep right off the start. And I want to talk about you because you describe yourself as a fighter, but you were someone who didn't have it easy growing up. Mm -hmm as a kid in high school into your 20s. And it took you a long time to figure out yourself, figure out who you were, what you wanted to be. And this fighter spirit, and it consumed you at a young age, but it also set the foundation for all the things that you've been involved in today. And as you've described it to me, it taught you that winning was the only thing you wanted to do, no matter the challenge. And so if you would define this fighter spirit inside you, where did it come from? What does it mean to you? And how do you use this every day in everything you set out to do? It's funny you use that word. And I think it's probably because I've used that word and maybe it's an unconscious thing that I do. And I, if I look back, even as I describe myself, whether it's on my website as a therapist, there is that fighting kind of communication that I'm putting out there. But the word, that idea actually is something I've moved away from. I think that I grew up in a house in which my father told a lot of stories about his fighting days, like experiences in scrapping mm -hmm. on the street with tough kids. And he, he really got off on it. And as a young man or, or even a boy, I think I idealized that idea. And as a man, especially as I've developed and understood myself better, I resist the idea that I am a scrapper because I think that was about being defensive and insecure and feeling small and weak. And I tried to have power over people compensate. And speaking of the, the high school experience, I was a late bloomer. I had, when I was maybe 18, 19, I had three, what I'd call pseudo pubic hairs on my chin. And I did not want to shave them off. That's called Because they were this sign of masculinity. <laughs> my body was hairless. I had weird nipples thing going on, which I learned later were nipple knots. Um, and they're, they're I've never heard that. <laughs> no, I didn't either till I was like 32. I thought I had cancer when I was in uh, high school because there was these lumps underneath my nipples that are, are pretty natural, but you go through it pretty quick. It took years for them to go away from me. And so there was this late blooming situation that my big mouth when I was younger then caught up with me because now I am in high school where there's all this kind of competition for attention. And I'm not developing like everybody else. But then there was some people who were like, hey, he was the one with the big mouth. And now let's fuck with this guy. And so there was a, a three-year period in which I guess we'd call it bullying was significant. And I would go through the back of the school every day and leave through the back because I did not want to be in a position in which I would be taken advantage of, abused, or feel small. And so that's what I initially went to therapy for was I had a few moments, early 20s, and my brother, Chris, as you know, who's eight years older than me, was there for a lot of them. He was a mentor and he took me under his wing. So we would go out in groups of, of friends. We'd go to New York City. And if somebody was looking at me weird, whether I knew what the hell they were looking at in my head, they were sizing me up and considering me weak and vulnerable. And because now I had come into my own, I'm not totally unattractive. I do put myself out there. There is a visual that makes me a target at times. So at times there was a target on my back. At times it was just somebody looking past me, not even looking at me. And I interpreted the wrong way. And so there was fights that happened that didn't need to happen. And ultimately a few friends said, dude, you got to go take care of this. This isn't healthy. And you're, put, you're inflating people who you don't even know into a power position that they don't deserve. And it wasn't like I would fight friends. I would fight these random people I didn't know. And so not only was it dangerous, but it was the prime reason I started moving into self-discovery and I went and got a therapist. So yes, I do use that word fighting because there is that grit. There is that, that part of me that's, that still has that I will not take an advantage of again. And I don't want my clients to. But it isn't out of a place of power over, 
but from a place of security. Can I be secure and know who I am and therefore don't have to overreact, but can still be powerful in this world? It's a really long answer. So let's talk about purpose. In, like, in the first minute we spoke a couple of weeks ago, you told me that you know and understand your purpose. And that not only do you know and understand your purpose, but that you have an understanding of how to represent it in your life and in the life of others. And you describe that as being this chair and this chair has four legs and you need all four legs to, to be balanced. Can you talk about this theory yeah. of the chair and the four legs? So I, I kind of see purpose as the table, the, maybe the dinner table that I sit at. It is the, it's the biggest thing in the room. And for me, my purpose is to help people understand things about themselves they didn't know they wanted to know. So why do I, why do I phrase it that way? Because I've had so many moments where people walked away or years later. I personally, I don't remember meeting you. Uh, it's not That's because okay. a lot of people don't remember me. <laughs> it's not because you're unremarkable. <laughs> and it might just be because I'm self-involved. Um, <laughs> it was more about what I was sharing with you and not what you were sharing with me. But I've had moments with folks like yourself where two, three years later, I bump into them and they say, hey, this moment in this bar, you said this and it changed my life. Now, I didn't know I did it and I wasn't trying to do it. It's just kind of this natural flow. And it's been there since I was a kid that I could just sit with people and I would probably be bold enough to say something that could affect them. And so when I was trying to understand my why, and this may be if people want some guidance in this, I really started developing this when I read that book, Start With a Why by Simon Sinek. He did a TED Talk on Start With a Why. And his conceptually, it was that your why is different than the how and what you do. The why is there regardless. It is the root system. And if you do not build, you know, if the tree does not come out of the root system, it's not authentic. And so he uses Apple or Martin Luther King's message that there is a why there and then how that's distributed, how the phone is distributed or, or how a great company puts out a product. If they're doing it well, it's based on the why first, usually out of some disruption. And then the how and the what are a whole other thing. So if my why is that I help people understand things about themselves they didn't know they wanted to know. The what could be teaching YouTube sessions. It could be this show that I'm trying to develop. It could be therapy as a therapist. It could be on a podcast. It does not matter if the purpose is the core. And the what is going to follow that purpose if you're doing it right. And the how is I'm self-revelatory. You're hearing it right now. I'm talking a lot about me. I know my story. There's a way I communicate my story that will help you understand your story. So it's kind of opening you up if I open up first. That was always a part of me, but it, it's a bit of the how. It's maybe one component of 20, 30, 40 that I, I utilize. You've spent seven years trying to launch this docuseries. And mm -hmm. that's a passion, uh, absolute passion. Pilot is produced. I watched it when you sent it to me last week. And it, I mean, it gave me goosebumps and inspired me at the same time because the title alone, Songs That Saved My Life, it really does make you stop and think for a second and say, hmm, maybe I never really thought about it that way, but when have I been a difficult or challenging situation and that song has come on the radio, on my phone, and all of a sudden my mood is completely changed? And I watched this pilot that you put together and literally was captivated. So talk to me about why did you put this together? What was the spark behind it? And what's the idea here? So one day, about eight years ago, I was sitting in my office and I get a call from Spike Channel, somebody that was connected to Spike Channel. Hey, we've got this show we want you to be a part of, or at least we're interested in you. It's called The Tattooed Therapist. And I'm like... <laughs> That's it you. Couldn't have been a better fit. <laughs> That's you. But I'm also sitting there going, I don't like reality TV. I don't really want to be a part of it, but I need to go down this road. So I talked to some close people. I mean, they said, go tell you have to say yes or no. So I went along the road and it was going pretty well. They, they were very interested in me. They wanted the film in California, not New York. So ultimately they wanted somebody with a license in California. So they ended up going with a whole nother 
crew of therapists. They, cho- they were choosing between me and three, and they chose three. It was painful because I just had seen what could have been. The show sucked. It was one episode. <laughs> I actually ended up seeing the producer on the West Side Highway. I was running one morning, and the production company was actually a New York production company, and he was riding his bicycle to work. And we hadn't seen each other since the, the test shoot. And he said, you really dodged a bullet, didn't you? And I said, I fucking sure as hell did dodge a bullet. Because it, <laughs> it was just, the whole thing felt phony. Just watching that one episode, it was just too produced. And I knew that that would have never worked for me. I would have challenged the shit out of them. And they would have hated me. They wouldn't have got what they wanted from me. So I came back and I talked to my brother, who you know, who is, works with your wife in the creative arts, you know, the creative directors and they, they're gifted at what they do. And my, I said to my brother, this is the time, like, let's create our own thing. And I needed his artistic genius, his ability to create words and form and concept. And I told him what I was thinking. Music needs to be a part of it. I want to be the host. I want to interview celebrities. And I want to get the story out of them in a way other people can't because I'm a therapist and I have that unique angle. Two weeks later, we go for a car ride. And he goes, listen to this song. He sticks in a Smith song. You know anything about the Smiths? Morrissey has a lot of emotion. And the song was called Rubber Ring. And it was about a record, like the actual disc, that was stuck in the corner of an apartment. And it was the album that got this person, this human, in the apartment through a tough time. And the album was saying, don't forget me now that you're in a good place. Don't forget the times that I helped you cry and the times I saved your life. And my brother goes, the show will be called The Songs That Saved Your Life. The logo will be the Sex Pistols logo with The Songs That Saved Your Life in it. And he had this image of Sigmund Freud with a Ramones t-shirt on, with his cigar in his hand and a leather jacket on. And I knew in that moment I could give my life to this. Like for however long it will last, if we get it made, I could give the next 10 to 20 years if we were ever so lucky to this concept. And so I remember having a therapy session that day with my therapist. And I remember telling him, and we both were like, this is fucking amazing. And we pitched it to, you know, just our friends and family. Like, what do you think? Everybody had a song. They had a song that got them through a hard time. And everybody was like, go. And so we started filming. Got a couple of people we just knew. We filmed in restaurants, beautifully set, but it was just me and them. And then we decided to put a two-minute sizzle reel together. And then do a Kickstarter to just raise some money to film some more. And within 10 days, Sony Records found out about us. We used the Kickstarter money to get the lawyer to sign the contract. And that's the story continues from there. And so you start to build this. And what becomes some of the challenges? Challenges were instantly, I'm not famous. So you even see with podcasting, who are the podcasters that are killing it? It's folks who... We're on usually the right on the outskirts of huge fame. And so they're connected to famous people. They have fame themselves. Your Mark Marins. Your Mark Marins is a great example. He's a comedian. He knows all the comedians. He's flirted with shows, had shows, possibility of shows on TV, and can communicate really well. Joe Rogan, similar. So they already have access to talent, they already have a following. They already have a gift for entertainment. I'm a guy who nobody knows, who has a therapy office in New York City and have made myself pretty obscure, almost intentionally. And so that was the first obstacle. Second obstacle is money. Copywriting a song is really expensive, which what Sony was going to really help with. Not They weren't going to give money. They were going to take care of this song rights. They wanted to find funding from outside and a platform. That's where I think the hardship was. They believed in it completely, but to get the other people on board was difficult. And I think it was a difficult time. It was right when Trump was coming into office. I think some of the sentimental stuff wasn't as much a priority. I think in the entertainment world, some more social activism, let's fight the powers that be. I think those kind of shows were probably going to be more prioritized. So I don't know. A number of reasons. But then you try to push through that by finding DMC. Yeah, well, that was... So we had a meeting with Sony and People Magazine and Entertainment Weekly. I mean, they wanted to be... 
Yeah, we were at the Time Inc. office right in Battery Park. We had this meeting with the execs there, and it was basically, let's meet Drew. We've seen the sizzle reel. Let's meet Drew and see if this is a good fit. And that's kind of how Sony pitched it to me before we went in. It's just be yourself. And it was interesting because the, the woman who was really captivated by the show, one of the people in our sizzle reel was this guy named Norbert Leo Butts who's a two-time Tony Award winner for Best Actor. And his song was a Bruce Springsteen song. And there was just a little clip in there. of Who you love, by the way. I love. And that's more recent, but yes. (laughs) So, but at the time, like Bruce wasn't, I wasn't into Bruce when I did this interview with Norbert. I didn't really know much about him. This was five years ago, six years ago. And the woman at People Magazine loved Norbert. It was her favorite Broadway actor. So there was already this connection. She just wanted to talk about Norbert. And Norbert was a great guy. Still, I still really appreciate him. Really thoughtful. And they really wanted to be a part of it. And so in the, in the meeting, they said, who do you want as guests? I just was reading People Magazine. And there was a, a little profile of DMC. His name is Daryl McDaniels. So he is the DMC in Run DMC. And they are the godfathers of hip hop. Everybody bows to DMC and DMC is considered to many one of the top MCs of all time. And they were one of the originals. Yeah, he is the one of the OGs and they changed everything. They were the first to go gold, first to go platinum, first to go multi-platinum, first on MTV, first with a like before them, there wasn't a lot of non-athletes with athletic brand connection. Run DMC, they had that song, My Adidas, and then they built a relationship with Adidas that they still have today. They were one of the first non-athletes to have that kind of connection to an athletic brand. Anyway, my brother's first album he ever got was the first Run DMC album. I was five, he was 14 or 13. Parents got it to him. So there was this like deep connection. And the whole concept of the show is about really me and my brother's relationship together and with music. So my brother mentions DMC and says, hey, this, he just wrote this book. It's called 10 Ways to Not Commit Suicide. And in the first chapter and last chapter, he talks about the song that saved his life. And People Magazine had just put out this article on it. My brother's like, he would be perfect. We don't know anybody who actually has a song, but we know he has a song. And they were like, oh, yeah, we could probably do that if we ended up working together. Yada, yada, yada. They weren't going to give Sony enough money to work with. It didn't go anywhere. Two years later, we are just about to end our relationship with Sony because it wasn't going anywhere and we were feeling a bit tied. The contract was ending. It was no fault of theirs. It was just that there was a lot of things working against Sony and us. And I went to the gym and I hadn't been to the gym in a month because I had an injury. My gym on 7th Ave was closed. So I had to go to Varick right by the Holland Tunnel. And I walked there from the West Village. So it was a new route. Never had gone there before. Went in the afternoon, which I never did. I always go in the morning. So I'm coming back. It's a summer day, sweaty, you know, done with my workout, walking down Hudson Street, which I never would have walked down if my other gym was open. And who do I walk past two blocks from my apartment? Fucking DMC. He's trying to put money into the parking meter and he can't figure it out. And I walk past him. I notice everything. I'm like, I have that visual mind and I just see, I see celebrities all the time. And I'm like, oh, that's so and so. And I'm sitting there on the corner going, I have DMC in front of me. I have friends who have given me thousands of dollars to make this show work. People who have believed in me, family who have supported me. Three to four years at that time of therapy I was doing to just survive wanting to keep going with this show that had all these obstacles. And I was actually thinking of keeping on walking because of ego. I didn't want to have to walk up to a celebrity because in my mind, even talking to you now, I am the most famous person that is a non-famous person that you've ever met. It's how my mind works. <laughs> it is honestly how my mind works. You need a little bit of that ego to to want to be on camera. So I sat there and I just got over myself. I was like, are you fucking kidding me right now? You have this opportunity. Who cares what he says? You have to put this into the universe, even to get the door shut in your face to know that that door needs to be shut. And you don't need to dream about it. Walked over him. And at the time I was still with Sony, I said, hey, D, we are both signed with Sony. I have a show I'm working on called The Songs That Save Your Life. And I would love to hear the story that I know that you have. And he's like, oh, me and so-and-so? I don't even want to name who the, the song is because 
I think we should just keep that. It's a good payoff. If ever this show ever gets aired, it's a good payoff. You gotta say something. Oh, oh, the story about me and so and so. And I said, yeah. He's like, yeah. Short conversation gives me his phone number, gives me his email address. I text him that day. He responds, and it worked. It's it's a real real phone. It was. That's what I was (laughs) trying to test. Is it a real (laughs) number? He writes back. Said, great to meet you. I remember when I left him in person. I was walking away. He goes, yo, 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 yo. One second. I turn around. He goes, therapy is gangster. <laughs> he just walked away. <laughs> so I text him. I end the text with therapy is gangster. He writes me back. I wrote him every week, three months, no response. After that, nothing. Gave it up. I thought this was our time. This was the thing. God had spoken, putting him in his, in my way. It's the hero's journey where supernatural aid <laughs> comes to my benefit. <laughs> And uh, a hero comes to my aid, and I, we get to go into the journey together, and we go to Mordor. I was really broken by that, but I also just said, it's not the right time. Six to seven months later, my brother, who was working with your wife at the time, he was called for m M&M or Mars, one of those companies, to go to Austin for South by Southwest to run their stage and their advertising and marketing at that event. So he had full access to a lot of things and to the bands. And DMC was speaking down there. He's doing a podcast. And in that podcast, he's talking about the song that saved his life and all that stuff. My brother goes up to him afterwards and says, hey, my brother got in touch with you nearly a year ago. Mentions what we were doing. He's like, yeah, yeah, I remember. I want to do that. Here's my information. My brother goes, no, 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 no. Where's your manager? Yeah. We've already done this once. This did not work. We need to talk to your manager. So connected to the manager, they became actually close and went to a couple of shows together. Chris went to some DMC events down there and they came back, came to one of my restaurants. We sat down, the four of us, me and my brother, who's the co-founder of the show or co-developer. And we just talked for two hours. And at the end, DMC says, I think this thing is going to go global. I'll give you access to every part of my life. And I want to help you make this happen. So we filmed. We actually left Sony at And that ended. We went on our own. We filmed it ourselves. I paid for it. And we started pitching it. And then coronavirus happened. And then uh, silent for nine months. And now I'm pitching it again. There's been a lot of rejection. So you talked about that rejection when we spoke. (laughs) Yeah. And I found it really intriguing because you said that although the support for this show has been challenging over the last, you know, from the start, but specifically over the last couple of months and eight months or 10 months, because you now have the pilot. So there's something tangible now. People can watch yes. it and get yeah. excited about it. You haven't quit because you said that no, although no one has come and said, okay, here it is, let's go. No one has told you to stop. Right. The word that keeps on coming up is obedience. There's something deep in my core that says this is going to happen, that it's not if it's when. And I've wrestled with that for six years. A lot of times it's been if. But there has been so many great artists, just great humans that have come alongside of us and said, we will help you with this. We want to do whatever we can to make it work that me and my brother believe in because of their resume and because of their character, including DMC in that. It's just character is it's so on point and his drive is so inspiring. And a producer that we have involved now, a producer director named David, who has come alongside and has done, has worked in this world his whole life and believes that this is, this is his calling at some level. This show is the culmination. It's part of his four legs. And so we've had all those kind of characters come along. And every time there was this moment in which giving up felt right, some supernatural thing happened. Whether that was a call, I had a call from a friend in Brazil once that shared a quote with me. That was the quote I was thinking about that morning. He's like, I think something's going to happen. It was just those kind of moments that are just weird, where I think Carl Jung would have called them serendipities. Just those moments where you go, oh, there's something bigger happening in the world, in the universe that I am not totally understanding, but it's telling me to keep going on this hero's journey. With all the challenges and temptations, there's all these revelations happening. And that's kept me from getting off course. And so I was just in Mexico with a ton of powerhouse leaders and all of them even were saying, it's going to happen and we're going to help. 
And so even there, I came back with these contexts in Hollywood, but still it just hasn't landed. And right now it's about financing and it's about connections and I'll know it. I'll know the right people when they reveal themselves, but if they don't ever reveal themselves, something else will have to be, I don't know, the thing that I go towards, but I can't imagine it not being this. It just feels so right. Well, you just keep driving. I mean, that's what it comes down to. You keep driving every day and you got to go until until somebody does stand up and says, no, it's not going to happen. And, and yep. here's the concrete reasons why it's not going to happen. And then even at that point, you probably still go for a little while. Oh, yeah. We've already gotten that for a number of people, but not the people that, not the one that's that, well, we're going to make sure they don't matter in our heads, at least, because everybody has a fucking opinion. Yeah. It's about do enough people, is there enough of a team in a community that resists that voice that are saying, yeah, I get why they're saying this, but no, we still believe in it. And there is. It's just the numbers are growing. It's now about finding that one. It's probably that one human out there who works in this world, who has the money and the platform and says, let's go. I mean, I just feel like everybody has this story. Everyone has their moment. They have something that they can relate to. I think in content generation, that's what people are looking for. They're looking for that thing that they can relate to and say, okay, I know when I felt like that. And so well, and music only- is music's universal and it is healing. And we go to it before we usually go to anything else. People are always saying, you know, oh, what kind of music do you like? And I laugh because I think I come across as some sort of lunatic because I'm like, I don't know. I like all music. <laughs> I mean, it just depends <laughs> on my mood, you know, man. And, and I go back and forth in these like wild swings and, you know, it can be hard rock to, you know, classical to, you know, stuff, modern electronic dance music. And then it's country. Yep. And it's, and it just goes from one to the other. And, and people say, well, how did you know what? That's not one kind of type. It's like, no, I, I like it all. It just depends on how I feel right now. I was thinking about this. I was thinking about what's my song. And it was like, I didn't know where to go, right? Because of what I just said, right? There's just so many times where it's like, well, how do I feel? How do I feel? And you know, so I kind of really had to think about those times in my life where it's been, it's been at the bottom and it, I've had them, many of them, <laughs> where I've sat there and said, like, everything in my life is going to change right yeah. now. And, and I don't know what's next. And that's scary. And I talk a lot about fear and the fear of the unknown. And can you sit there and, you know, as a leader, you have to be confident that you can understand that you're in a position right now where there's an unknown ahead of you and not be intimidated and fearful, mm-hmm. of it, but internalize it and say, okay, because I know that there's uncertainty ahead of me, I'm actually in a better position than if I just sit here and become overtaken by this, these emotions because then I can generate a plan. I can think about what I need to do and I can start to prioritize things. And we'll go into the Enneagram now. And that probably comes back to, you know, what my core, right? Yep. right trying to solve for problems. But I was thinking about what's my song. And I thought about where are you when you're always kind of in these moments where you're thinking about your life. And so I always find myself in the car, right? It's when you're in the car by yourself and, and you know, you should catch up with people and call people on the phone, but you don't really want to. So you kind of listen to music or you zone out, or maybe you listen to a podcast, maybe this podcast. Um, and then, but that's also the point where when you've been there a few times, you, there's kind of always a song that may come on that always resonates with you. And so I was thinking mm-hmm. this, that's happened to me several times. And it's actually this song by a guy named John Parr. It's called Man in Motion, and it's from the movie St. Elmo's Fire. So it's a bit older, but it resonates with me so much because it's about seizing opportunity, understanding that right now things are really bad. But if you seize opportunity and you see it, then you will get out of it. And so I took a couple of notes that I wanted to share with you. And and I even took the timestamps nice. <laughs> because I'm kind, nice. of, kind of a nerd, right? And so like 43 seconds in to this, he says, play the game. You know, you can't quit until it's won. Soldier on. Only you can do what must be done. Mm. And that's the drive and the resiliency that I believe is one of kind of my core strengths where you can't quit. And it's, yeah. it's telling me, don't quit. And because I was in the special forces, there's this element of being a soldier and you have to stand up and you have to figure it out and you don't just get to walk away. But then there's this individuality of no one's going to do this for you. You're Mm. in this situation. Probably you put yourself in this situation. So you need to own that because nobody's coming in here to fix it for you. It's going to be you. And then that leads into this refrain of, 
I can see a new horizon underneath the blazing sky. I'll be with the eagles flying higher and higher. Take me where the future is lying. Mm. And then that's that optimism of, okay, if I own my past, I understand it. I don't quit. I can look ahead and I can get it back. Right. And then resonates that, you know, you're flying high again. And it's like, okay, now there's all this emotion of optimism and perseverance, and it's not going to be like this forever. And then a minute 53, it comes to, I can make it. I know I can. You broke the boy in me, but you won't break the man. And then it goes straight back into the refrain. And so that is maturity. And I see that as maturity in my life from when you know, I was younger. And I was very much like you. you know, I wanted to fight everybody in the room. Uh, <laughs> and it didn't matter who they were. If they yep. looked at me wrong, if they, if they bumped my shoulder, you know, and then that escalated, you know, with the, usually commensurate with the amount of beers that I had. You know, uh-huh. would then judge how long that that fuse was. I'm just uh, relating. I'm just relating. <laughs> and so I I think about that and the maturity that you have as a young person to as you get older, where you're able to internalize things much better and much faster with much more clarity and calmness. And so there's the opportunity to say, earlier in my life, I would have become overcome by what's happening to me right now, but now I can stop, understand it and chart the path forward. And so this is a song that I always go to when I've been in those situations. And I, like you, have been there uh, with tears in my eyes, you know, saying, okay, just, you're going to get through this, but you got to do it. You got to own it. Yeah. Do you allow yourself in those moments to feel the pain or is it really about getting out of it? I think it's about getting out of it. I'm really a problem solver. I try to understand what got me here, but also understand that there's just, I mean, you're there, there's nothing you can do. And I try not to dwell on that. And it's, it's that short memory they talk about with, you know, with athletes all the time, you know, you've got to just get up and forget about it and move on and learn from it. But I try not to think about those things in terms, uh, in a way that will become paralyzing to the next step. And that doesn't mean that you know there are not times where I sit there and put my head in my hands and say oh, you know, all is lost. Um, there is no hope. I mean that you, you have that, but I think those times get shorter when you can sit there and say, "Okay, well, I, I just got to figure out how to get out of this." Yeah, I'm just tempted to be a therapist right now. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about therapy, um, and let's talk about the uh, the enneagram um, and this sure. the, the theory behind it and this perspective that personality is by nature interconnected and multidimensional. And this Enneagram theory is used in mental health and team building and leadership development. And it's kind of centered around these nine core personality types that have these wings that are bring associated personality types to them. And then there are these different directions that your personality goes and you exhibit these ten- different tendencies under stress and under security being kind of two different ends of the, of the spectrum, right? Safety and security, and then stress and unknown. And so if you would, for a little bit, talk about the Enneagram theory, why you chose it as your practice, you know, how you're grounded in it. And then for all the listeners, there's kind of a complex matrix around here that I think we'll try to explain as best we can, but we'll make sure that the diagrams are in the show notes. And we'll, we're actually, when we make the cover art, we're going to have the Enneagram model on there. So if you're listening on your phone, you can pull it up, look at the, the cover art for the episode, and you'll be able to see it there. Again, we'll have it in the show notes so that everyone can reference it because it was a little, little bit complex, but we'll do our best to break it down. Yep. It suggests that our desires and our defensiveness to the world are interconnected. So we protect ourselves by using one of these, and it is also our Achilles heel in a sense. So mine, for example, is envy. I'll give you a a quick example. If I walk out of my apartment right now in the West Village, I have to the left of me, the building directly next to my building is Julianne Moore's house. And it is a full townhouse, maybe four floors. If I walk to the right, there is Julian Schnabel's building. He's one of the great contemporary artists of our time. And then past his place is Calvin Klein's and Hugh Jackman's house. Now, Hugh's is the one that I really center on. If I go over to the West Side Highway and I go on the Charles Street Pier and I look back, it is three floors, the full floor, all glass, and you can see in, there's spiral steps and there's a Peloton up there and a track and a, it's a whole thing. And my envy just starts flaring. 
we suffer from all of the passions, all of the sins, in a sense. They're, you could change those words up, passions or sins. So I, I struggle with fear at times and deceit and pride and whatever, anger, gluttony, lust. But envy is the one that really hits me the most. It, it is my dark passenger. So I'm sitting on Charles Street Pier and the thoughts that come up are, why does Hugh have this? Fuck Hugh. I should have that place. I could put great couches in that place. I could have great parties at that place. I can build community and fellowship and I could have you over and I could have some of the, some of the <laughs> folks listening and I could storehouse great bourbon and all of those things that are that envy just getting in my system. Now at about to be 43, that goes pretty quickly because I've worked through it. But it's still there. And it's there all throughout the day. You mentioned me being 6'4". If I walk past a guy who's 6'4", I instantly want to be 6'2". I don't want to really be 6'4". It's, <laughs> that's too much. But I still want to be taller. And if his smile is such or his lady is a nice looking lady, there's an instant like, I'm better than that guy. Because my way of dealing with MB is to get competitive. And this is where we'll get into the subtypes. But envy also drives me. So if I see all these things that are awesome out in the world that I want, well, then I strive for them. And so the four, I'm a four, which is the individualist or the romantic. We tend to be the most emotional, most prone to suicide, most prone to art, most prone to communication, that it fuels a lot of my desire to take in, to become this great, original, authentic self that will wow and impress. Because what am I charged by? Being impressed by other things and other people. Well, then I also want to impress. So it's this double-edged sword. And that's the beauty of the Enneagram. Is it shows you your wheats and your weeds. And it actually suggests you can only pull out so many weeds. They're going to keep on coming up even if you keep on pulling them out. You just have to have a good ability to garden this plot. to Get the weeds out as quick as possible, even though they're going to keep on coming up. And in my case, envy is going to be with me all day, but I need not hate it. And so each of us have this primary one. And then when we throw subtypes on it, it gets even more complicated. Yeah, but you're born with this. So what I think is we have a predisposition and there is three centers of intelligence, heart, head, and gut. So I tend to be in, the, I'm in the heart camp. Two threes and fours are heart camp. If you were an eight, you'd be in the gut camp. And so that is how we move in the world. We make decisions from these places. And I think that I was probably born a heart person. And then the nature of my environment subjected me to one of those actual, like a two, three, or a four. So in my case, the four is about individuality, uniqueness, authenticity. We want to find our worth through you thinking that we are special. The three wants to find their worth through ambition and what they do. It's about, did I achieve a certain thing that you could be impressed by? And the two is bent on, have I cared for people well? They're a caregiver. So have I helped well? I think if I grew up in a house in which I had a parent who was really needy, perhaps an alcoholic or somebody who had physical ailments, or I was born the first child, not the third child that I might have went into caregiver mentality. If my parents were a bit, a bit more intense or demanding on grades and performance, I might have been a three. But I was the youngest of three. I also got a lot of attention because I was the youngest. So I wasn't just young, like, oh, I'm the third, third in line. I was, I was a surprise. So I'm seven years younger than my middle brother and eight years younger than my old brother. So it's, there's not as much competition and there was a lot of attention because I'm a baby and there's the gap there. So the competition for them wasn't as high. And my parents had chilled out quite a bit because they had parented for a while. So there wasn't as much high demand on me. So I think that that's where I'd put it. I also think people could be on that border of gut and like say gut or heart or gut and head, you know, you could swing either way. So I think it's a nurture nature thing. And I don't, this is where it's not scientific. It's hard to figure that out. And is anything, any one of these better than another? No. And no differentiation between male or female? Maybe some of the ways it would be manifest, but we live in a culture in which now 
women are having more ability and more possibilities to be an achiever, but that might have had to be repressed early on, you know, in the 50s or whenever back in the day. And so might have been more confusing for them to get at some of that. And that's just an example. You know, there, there's certain cultures in which it's not as acceptable to be certain numbers. If you run down the list of the nine and you have yep. this, you have this circle. And if you think about nine points equidistant apart on the circumference of the circle, nine at the top, going from right to left, right? Starting with one, you have perfectionist, helper, achiever, individualist, investigator, loyalist, enthusiast, challenger, peacemaker. Mm -hmm. How do you characterize somebody? What's that process? As far as figuring out their number? Mm -hmm. Figuring out how, yeah, who, who the, how, yeah, what it's, they It's represent. kind of threefold. I would give them a test. And sometimes the tests, again, this is like a pseudoscience. So there's a bit of mysticism in this. It's not to me like a horoscope. Because if, for example, I went, I read my favorite fiction book, which is East of Eden by John Steinbeck. The character descriptions, and this is written probably in the 30s, 40s, maybe 50s, before the Enneagram was really developed or known as a, a typology. You'd see that those characters fit the numbers. And throughout time, throughout history, people fit into these categories. So they're pretty accurate. I would be looking for, personally, as, as just in relationship to people, just some of the common themes. Then I'd go to, do they tend to be gut, heart, or head people? Do they get stuck in their head? Do they get stuck in their emotions? Do they get stuck in some of their hostility? Because <laughs> gut people tend to be hostile. and The nines don't know it that well. Sevens don't either. Eights are pretty comfortable with their hostility at some level. Well, I, I know exactly when so, I'm hostile. <laughs> yeah. So, And then I would be looking at subtypes. And the subtypes are really interesting because the subtypes again, have been talked about well before the Enneagram was developed. So it, it was incorporated in and it's, it's sexual, social, and self-preserving. So if you're a sexual type, doesn't mean you like to hump and get down, but you probably don't mind that. It's that you are intense and looking for exalted moments, that you are, want, you are primarily interested in the one-on-one -on -one relationship or small groups. So this might be with certain authors. Like I really like John Steinbeck. I will devour John Steinbeck because I really deeply pair with him in my mind. I don't read, like you were just talking about music and like, I'm into all kinds of music. Well, I'm very specific. I pair with certain things because I'm a sexual type. And so we are stacked. We're all three, but sexual types, more intense. They pair. If they go into a party, they're thinking about who do I want to talk to? Who's going to be interesting to spend the night with here in this party? and drown out a lot of the noise so I could really get deep with them. The self-preserver is going to go into a party, worry about where the food is, what's the best room to be in, and do I have the right resources to be here? Am I energized enough to deal with all these humans? Because they're least concerned about the human interaction. They are worried about maybe Maslow's lower needs, shelter, food, how their body is being preserved, how their mind and heart are being preserved to go and handle the world with. And then the social types are going to walk into that party and think, how do I fit into the herd? Who's the most powerful here? Who's the least powerful? Will I be accepted by the group? So you might notice when you're talking to a social type at a party, they might be looking around quite a bit. Like, what's going on? Who's Jim talking to? Who's Susie talking to? Are they having a better conversation than I am? Now, the sexual type, they've chosen. They might move on because they're bored, but they have, they're not looking at everybody. They've kind of said, there's a couple people here that I've, are striking my fancy. Who is going to walk through life with me? Or the group. And these are all instincts we have built early on in life to protect us. Now, in a sense, we don't have pterodactyls chasing us anymore or T-Rexes trying to eat us. A lot of our needs have been met. But the emotional needs of how do I stay safe with humans is a priority. So if you came from an abusive childhood or a great childhood, you would have developed a certain instinct to handle life and so a lot of people think these were more nurture-based. Like they're more, I'm presented with an environment. How do I deal with it? And how do I survive this situation, feel safe, secure? So I'd be looking for those things. I know that's a lot, but I'd be looking for those things. The test will give you that. And then I'm going to ask them, what are they gravitating towards? Because people spend years trying to figure it out. 
for me, all I had to do was when I first heard about the Enneagram and I decided to look at it, I looked down on the paper and went, holy shit, that one is essentially the description of what my notes as a client, I take notes for every therapy session that I am a client in with my therapist. I have book, it's in front of me right now with just notes from all of my therapy <laughs> sessions. And if I went back and looked at all of those things that I have struggled with and I continue to struggle with today, they all fit into that category of the individualist. It was so blatantly obvious to me. And then it was just about learning a bit more. That was how I felt about the challenger. When I read the description of, of eight, that was how I felt, uh, especially what, when you start adding in you, something. Yeah, what struck you the most? Well, I mean, it's kind of defined by self-confidence, decisive, willful, confrontational. When I started adding in the, some of the other pieces, for instance, where you talk about the centers, right? And you, you defined yep. the centers as eight, nine, and one being gut, two, three, and four being heart, and five, six, and seven being head. And then you can also classify those as eight, nine, and one, you know, it's kind of gut, but also that's your instinctive center that is mm -hmm. manifested in anger and rage. And two, three, and four are the heart and that's the feeling center, but it manifests in shame. And yep. five, six, and seven are the head, but that's the thinking center and it's manifested in fear. And so, although I experience at times, all of these things. And I think that's one of the cool things about you know, the Enneagram is that you exhibit all nine of these personality traits in yep. some way, and it manifests in some way of your personality at, at all times, but you're core to, to one. And so I look at myself and I say, okay, well, you know, of these descriptions of each one of the nine, you know, I most identify with this level of self-confidence, decisiveness, willfulness, confrontational, while at the same time, I do manifest my frustrations and you know, manifest things in anger and rage. I'm not an overly technical person that looks at an engineering floor and says, okay, I understand how all this works. You know? And mm -hmm. also I know, and not only have I been told, but I also know that at times I do not have the level of empathy that I probably should. So from you know, kind of that heart perspective, periods of time where I don't identify as well with that. And so as I broke that down, that was kind of where I went towards. And then I went to these, the wings and said, okay, well, you know, and I'll let you describe the wing theory, but that kind of resonated with each side of the challenger. So uh, yep. but why don't you talk about the wings? The wings are just whatever the two numbers are to the side of you. So if you're an eight, your wing is going to be a seven or a nine. And really this means that you just, you're more developed towards those numbers. You lean a certain way. So in my own life, I'm a four wing three, but three is actually the next highest number I score on the test. So that's the ambitious type. So I am an entrepreneurial four in a sense. You know, I am a driven four and I lean that way. I don't lean head. While I can get stuck in my head, I don't perseverate too much on fear, and I am not, not structured in that way. So that's actually the part of me that I have to develop. Like any wings of any, you know, any bird, if one is operating too strongly, you're just going to go in a circle. So the idea with the Enneagram is that you develop both sides of yourself. You realize the parts that are weak or deficient, and you just start trying to develop those. So for me, that would look like, trying to tap into that head part of myself. It's underdeveloped. So I think with the wings, you know, a test would give you that readout, but you really have to look and go and be honest with yourself and go, where do I lead? Which side do I lead on? It doesn't mean it's your next highest number. It just means that you tend to gravitate towards that as being more comfortable to be in, more comfortable to utilize those skill sets. Does that make sense? It does. And that's why I think I lean more towards that, the head area and the seven in the enthusiast where it's spontaneous, versatile, acquisitive, somewhat scattered, or what can come across as scattered for sure when you try to get involved in, in a lot of different things, you know, versus, versus the peacemaker, which you know, they define as receptive, 
reassuring, complacent, resigned. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily classify myself there. And if you, so these, there's categories of numbers too. And the sevens and eights are assertive types. So this is why I asked you, and I said, I wanted to put on my therapist hat when you were talking about your song. And it was so much about assertiveness. This song was like a beautiful, hey, get your shit together. Let's go. And that's come across at times as abrasive, I've been told. (laughs) Not only, but not only abrasive, it has to have a cost. And the cost is your emotions. It will be harder to relate to you emotionally if everything is about the mission. How can I just be with this person? How can I, how can I talk about my emotions and not get reaction back, which is like, well, here's what you could do about it. Let's go. Let's do this. This is the steps. And if you did that to a four, you could do that maybe to a sexual four, which is what I am. You will totally miss them because they want to be known and understood. And that will actually help them be driven. But if you tell them what to do and you tell them what to do in a, in a very practical way and don't acknowledge their emotions, you will essentially just trample on them and you'll get less active and productive person. This is why I love the Enneagram. I mean, it's magic in marriages because for 20 some odd years, these people have been trying to change each other. They didn't realize it ain't changing. This is the number they are. And this is the subtype they are. And if there's, if the subtypes aren't really understood by this couple, they can destroy each other because they're just trying to get each other to live this the way they do best. So I know with you, if I was in a car with you and we were listening to music and your tears came up, my senses, my senses, I don't know you well enough. You probably push them away quick enough to try to push on to some focus that is in the distance, which requires you to get ready and get engaged to produce. Yeah. We immediately start talking about where we're going and what we're going to do. Yes. (laughs) Now to me, The assertive types are always going to underdo emotion. Additionally, they're going to be blinded to their opportunity. For me to know what the legs of my chair is required a lot of pain and a lot of me sitting in the pain and a lot of me knowing what not to do. Now, I'm not suggesting that threes, sevens, and eights, which are the assertive types, aren't passionate about what they do or aren't purposeful about what they do. But many, when they're not aware of their emotions are just doers getting shit done, but it isn't as purposeful or definitive to who they are as it could be. So Carl Jung would say, don't compare, don't contrast. Everybody else's path is a temptation to you. Now, I think the threes, the seven and eights can be tempted by a lot of paths because they're moving so much that they don't actually focus on what their true path is. Now, that's not an accusation. Uh, so they have to find ways to slow down. A lot of times it is meditation, but even the right type of meditation that they can investigate their soul a bit. Because it's that old adage, which is most of life's problems are because a man can't sit in a room by himself. And the sevens and eights have a real tough time sitting in a room by themselves. Oh, yeah. They, the that's, not, that's not productive. <laughs> no, no, I'm getting nothing done if I'm by myself. Yeah. So where I wanted to go with you on that song is like, if you were in my office to help you balance yourself out, to help you develop the parts that are underdeveloped and especially the heart, I'm not saying you're not, you don't care, you don't have empathy, but it's not going to be a primary tool of yours is to stop and feel, slow down and sit and let me just, just feel what I'm feeling right now. I would have to work with you on that. And the goal would be to actually make your production more effective in the long run because you'd be more tapped into what makes you you and what you should gravitate towards. But you might cry also because I'm going to try to get you there. <laughs> I just have to start talking about something else. Yeah, I would, and I know that was coming because I know you were an eight. <laughs> so we mentioned that you have this core personality trait and then you exhibit a complementary or what or sometimes opposite characteristic whether you are under stress or whether yeah. you are in times of safety do you want to talk a yeah bit it's about beautiful that? it's beautiful so i'll i'll just keep on using myself cuz i'm i'm a forward i'm self referential we're very subjective so 
if you were visualizing this in the audience, there's a circle, then there's a triangle within the circle, and there's a hexagon within the circle. So there's like this seven part thing within the circle, a three part triangle, and then your circle. So the circle is about unity. The triangle is about the law of three. A hexagon, hex is seven, right? Am I right? I always get those messed up because I'm more of a heart person. I don't care as much about this practical stuff. Hex is six. Uh, let's go with whatever seven is. I don't need to know what the hell seven is. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's within this circle. So there's seven, seven parts hitting the circle. It's much too complex to talk about here, but your number will make a triangle. It's not a perfect triangle. It's just, I actually think the, the nine, three, six is like a perfect triangle, but mine, my four gravitates towards a one and a two. So there, it makes like a weird, really fine triangle there. When I am in stress, I will look like a two version of a four, meaning I might, they are the caregivers. They really care about helping people. And if they are not healthy, they are going to help people who are likely not to get helped and they might spend their life on it. This is where you see like an alcoholic who is a caregiver. We look at them and go, oh, the saint and the sinner. She cares so much about him and just spends her life trying to help him out. And he's so bad. And I go, no, they're equally dysfunctional. This person's finding all their worth in helping the person who can't get help. So they get to stay in a state of not really progressing because they're fearful of progressing because that would require much more of them in life. When the four is insecure, rejected, hurting, afraid, I'll look like a two a little bit. I'm going to probably gravitate towards getting help or giving help to find worth. So I might really want to help somebody, be a caregiver, or I might really want to go and get nurtured. If I am feeling secure, safe, healthy, I'll look like a one version of a four. Well, fours are subjective. Ones, they are the reformer. They're perfectionist. They are moral. They, they don't want to be corrupted. They have a lot of balance. Well, the four is very emotional, very subjective, can often be erratic with their emotions, very sensitive. We, when we are in a good place, will look a little bit more balanced, less giving a shit about what people think about us. We'll give more form and order to things. Let me give you countries. They say the four is like France, Parisians. We dress well, we look cool, we have artistic ability, style. We're pompous and elitists. We think that our art is the best art. Now, the reformer probably looks more like a German. The one, how do I get things done properly with order, with efficiency? How can I be moral? Now we can look back at history and have our issues with the Germans. But even there in their, their dark history, there was this like, this is the way it should be done. It must be pure. It's just an extreme version, an unhealthy version of a country that's a one mentality. Well, what essentially you're doing is taking this flamboyant elitist artist and going, here, let's have some form and some order and not be so worried about what other people think. Oh, cool. Well, you might be really productive then. You might be a great artist who actually changes the world. So that is how each number has these counter numbers that they can look to to go, that's the part of me that is under-exercised. It's underdeveloped and I have to develop it. So for example, I have a lot of friends who are nines. Their sin is sloth. It's not necessarily that they're lazy and they're slow. Well, they are a bit slow, but they're slow to their passions, desires, their feelings, but they're a peacemaker. So they want to keep peace in the world. So they're at like a very safe place to land, but they often are not very productive. They can't get work done. Like they could be on a team and do their part. They can work for a company and they, they work hard, but they can't kind of in their own life put that productivity and make it, make the achievements big or the entrepreneur that they'd love to be maybe. So they have to look to the three, who is the ambitious type. And it's just this natural connection. And you can use that the rest of your life to go like, am I actually accessing that right now? Am I that? It's like the can candy coating outside of you are all chocolate, but the M&M is like, for me, I'm chocolate, but I have a, a coating of one when I'm in a good place and a coating of a two when I'm in a bad place. Yeah. And I saw that even with mine where, you know, I know that in times of stress, I go to the five as an investigator 
where I need to solve, I need to solve the problem. And then in times of security, I become the helper where it's, I'm more attuned to what other people may need and more inclined to be a resource to them versus in stress where it's like, I got to get this done. So what's the goal of the, the Enneagram? You know, I look at it and I say, okay, well, what is your, per- your personality is kind of this combination and this equation, if you will, of the core plus the wing, plus how do you feel in security? How do you feel in stress? And then that becomes you. Yep. Here's your sins. Here's your strengths. Here's your wheat and your weeds. And they're going to live together. Get over it. Don't think that on your deathbed, you are going to be completely well. And if you know that, then you can be patient with yourself and you can chip away, chip away. And when these moments happen, like on the West Side Highway and I'm sitting on Christopher Street Pier and I'm looking at Hugh's place and the dark passenger starts screaming for his apartment, I slow down and go, of course you're doing that. Envy is always your passenger. Cool. Get over it, dude. Let's move on. Hugh's awesome. I'm sure. I hope he enjoys his place. Really? Hey, how about your place? It's pretty awesome too. Enjoy it. And uh, move on until I walk like five steps and I see the guy who's taller than me and a guy I want to be another inch taller. (laughs) And then the envy starts again. (laughs) And for me, it's just cutting down on the hauntedness of that experience. So you're on a path right now to bring music into the Enneagram. What's going on with that project? Because I saw all these sticky notes on your board (laughs) in front of you. And when I asked you, you're like, oh yeah, that's my project to bring music to the Enneagram. So now I have to ask. I've been working on this project for six years. And because I am a four, there's no doubt that this is a huge component of it. I have kept myself hidden on the macro level from the world. I have not done podcasts. I have not done any kind of teaching that has been for for the masses. I've not done any interviews. I've not, not put myself out there. Because in my mind, I will reveal myself with this show. I will arrive. You will not have known about me. Who is this person? Now he's here. So I didn't want to do any of the things that would put myself out there until the time I thought was appropriate was when the show happened. Now, the show may never happen. And I've got gifts. But we're still going to put it out there. (laughs) And and I've got gifts to give the world. And so while I was in Mexico, I was around a number of people who were high performers and they were out there doing macro level things on whatever level. And none of them, in my mind, were any more powerful than me. And it had any stronger message than me. But a lot of them had books. A lot of them had apps. A lot of them had a thing. So even on your podcast, I might be one of the only people who doesn't have this long resume of public attributes. And, and that I am now at a point where I don't give a fuck because I know I'm, I'm going to pull people in with my personality, whether you like it or you don't like it. So I had to reckon with that. And I had to say to myself, it is now time to be out there. And how can I be out there in the way that I like? I don't want to do a podcast, I told you. One is because I won't be seen. And I think facial expressions and body movement and mannerisms and the aesthetics of the environment are just important to me. I care about them. So what's a lesser level than uh, my show? YouTube. So I'm working on a a series right now only on the Enneagram 4. It's called 4 by 4. Four things every Enneagram 4 needs to know, given by a 4. So we're doing the subtypes first. That's social, sexual, and self-preserving. We are all three, and we are stacked of importance, and then the one that's least important to you. But when you go into that party, you're all three. You just have a dominant and a repressed. So I care least about the the herd because it's my least prioritized. But even those we have to integrate because the Enneagram is about wholeness. It's about integration. So the first three episodes are an introduction to the subtypes, and then each subtype. And I'm using the music and the lyrics of Stephen Patrick Morrissey from the Smiths, Morrissey, who I think is a four. And each four of the categories is a song that represents that subtype in a different way. I will be moving on towards a five-part series that I'm just filming the last part today, which is rest. And it is all about work. How do fours get the most work out of themselves? Now, I know where this is going to go, which is going to go to probably other numbers and other things that I want to do. Like I want to do an episode on Jerry Seinfeld, an episode on my five mentors that are not by my side, my mentors in abstention or my vicarious mentorship. John Steinbeck, the writer, I like to diversify my group of artists. So I've got the writer, the comedian, poet, the psychologist, and the singer. So it's Bruce, Carl Jung, Rainar Marie Rilke, 
admission, I don't like poetry. I don't read his poetry. I just like all the other stuff he wrote. And Seinfeld and Steinbeck. Now, when I do any of these YouTubes, I try not to take quotes from all over the place. Here's a Churchill quote and a Lincoln quote. And I'd rather be singular and centered. So I use those five particularly throughout all of my my episodes. I've not posted them yet, but ultimately they will be posted on Drew Newkirk YouTube. Maybe by the time this airs, they'll be out. So you have these investments in the restaurant industry. And as I understand it, you actually took your more common investments, like in the market and stuff, and you kind of yeah. viewed those as transparent, right? Or you were, they were invisible. And you decided to take that out and then put it into something that was more tangible and more visible, although quite risky. What was that thought process? And what is it that intrigues you so much that you would take this risk? Some of it was ignorance and arrogance and vanity. <laughs> That's hum- uh, humility. I mean, yeah, this was years ago where... I just know that my experience with New York City is very much centered around restaurants and bars. When I first moved to the city, a lot of the friends that I already had were bartenders or bar owners. And I learned a lot about the business by sitting there and just observing. And in the lower part of Manhattan, there's a few people who do the, I guess what you'd call like a small bar restaurant really well that have usually more than five places. And I know them all for the most part, at least the ones that I respect. And I've gotten to know them. And one I've gotten really close with over the years. And when he was, his first few ventures were really successful. And his third venture was going to be in my neighborhood. And the fourth venture was going to be a nautical theme bar. And I'm a a beach guy also. So he gave me the opportunity to jump in on these. And, And they only take money from very close friends or family. But I I saw him as disruptive to the game when he first came out. They do cocktails at a high level at full capacity, are packed five deep, and they are pumping out all fresh ingredients, and they're known for it. And if you ask people in the industry about them, their team, they'd know it. So I I try to only attach myself to people I really have found to be disruptive in their industry and also well-respected. But to me, the bar is a place that I can go to get away from communicating all day, but still communicate. I could talk to the bartender and all the people who work there, but they're busy. So no one's going to take all my time. I could jump in and out of conversation. But additionally, when I have people in town, friends and family, I can bring them to this place and treat them well. Because New York's tough. It's Not everybody has the apartment to do that in. Now, I, I'm lucky to have a big apartment, but I like the idea of going out. So this is a place I can host at. Additionally, I wanted to learn the industry more. And it is a part of my business psychology that I don't get to exercise some of that more corporate work, the more team building, more like who's the right fit, who's not the right fit. Basically a silent investor. I'll get asked about things that are high level just to say like, hey, how'd you experience this? And I'm pretty definitive on what I experienced. So sometimes that is helpful to the team. But ultimately, it's, it's in support of them, too, of what their mission is and how they visualize how to treat people when they walk in that door and how that person will feel instantly. How do you set up an environment to make a person feel a certain way? And as a therapist, it's hugely important to me. I have clients who have picked me based on my website visually, said, I knew when I walked into your office that I would feel a certain way. And they were right. While I don't have pictures of my office on my website, at least my New York City website. I know people instantly feel safe in here. So I look for that instant thing, those singular ideas where people are certain of a vision. Adaptable, but certain. They have a plan A and they're usually not going to go to plan B because they're going to see plan A through, even if it's tweaked. So it's been a joy, but coronavirus did not help. We lost one restaurant. So I lost a big investment there. And uh, we also opened up a restaurant during that time. So it was supposed to be the second part. We have Wild Sun, which is on the west side, and we were opening up Wild Sun on the east side. The cool part about it is it's wildly successful already, even during coronavirus. We're not out of this pandemic yet, but we had to close the other one down. It just was more tourist-centered and kind of had an idea that this is not going to be a thing we should keep long-term. Let's cut the losses and move on. So 
I actually appreciated their wisdom in making that decision, but I have to grieve the financial loss. But also this new thing is being birthed. And we've talked about my other financial investments personally. I had to grieve the fact that the investments I took from to invest in the restaurants have been really successful since. But I do have to ask uh, before we close out, and I bring it up every time, that the Jedbergs needed three things to be successful in their operation in World War II. They had to be able to shoot, they had to be able to move, and they had to be able to communicate. If they could do those three things well every single day, then any challenge that came their way, they could conquer. What are the three things every day when you wake up, you say, if I can do these three things well today, I will be better at the end of the day when I go to bed than I was when I woke up. So I'm going to cheat. I'm going to actually steal the Jed's work. I did a little research on the Jed's. I know that they, <laughs> they, that they were on the, the name comes from the Scottish border people who are the border reavers. Mm-hmm. And they just sound like badasses. They, they trained on the, in the Scottish Highlands before they went into battle. I am a communicator. It is my life. From out of the womb, I was a communicator. It's what I do well. And so I really appreciate that that was part of what was their core. And it is part of my core. It's top three. The shooting. Now, this is, I actually love the metaphor here because many parts of my life, I was a machine gun and not a sniper. And a sniper gets rid of the bullshit and the noise. They are narrow, singular, and centered. And they are no longer, in the metaphor that I'm going to use here, comparing and contrasting themselves to all the other folks out there that are maybe doing it better. And as I've grown, I've become more of a sniper. I know what I can shoot well and how, what my range is and what are good targets. And in the movement sense, that I know what to move towards and move away from. And also that I just move. Not disregarding or abdicating my responsibility to my emotion, but that action is important. There's this uh, in New Mexico, Richard Rohr, who's a, a guy that I am impressed by as far as his work, and he's who introduced me to the Enneagram, not personally, but in his work. He has this center called the Center for Contemplation and Action. And he says the most important word in that phrase is end. That when contemplation and action are unified and working together, that's when we get the best results. That contemplate, then plunge. And so the movement into what is mine to do, what is mine to shoot, and that being communication, communicating well, and communicating on those four levels, bringing you in, hosting, of art, music, of entertainment, the visual. How do you communicate aesthetically? And to the heart, psychologically. That's where I want to be at. I like that. Damn it. I just put that. I just got that. (laughs) We'll save that. We're going to save that for you. (laughs) Truly inspirational. I look at you and I think back to the nine soft characteristics and I say, you know, what are the ones that make up Drew? And, you know, the top one on my list is drive. There is a drive. There's a need for achievement. There's this growth mindset that you exhibit. There's a drive to be better every day, continuous self-improvement that you have for yourself and you pass on to to your clients and everybody around you. I know that after this conversation with you, I'm I'm better than I was before this. And there's this opportunity to learn as much as you can and contribute uh, to the well-being of the community. So Drew, thanks for joining me on the Jed Burke podcast. It's truly been an amazing conversation. So excited to learn from you today. And I look forward to having you back on and we can keep this conversation going. The post show being successful, we're going to get back together. Absolutely. You're awesome, man. I, I can't wait to see where this goes. Amen. American Jedbergs went on to form the foundation of the United States Special Forces and the Special Activities Directorate of the Central Intelligence Agency. Thanks for listening to the Jedberg Podcast. I'm your host, Fran Rachopi. We're brought to you by the Talent War Group, an executive search firm and talent advisory. We'll drive you to attract, retain, and develop top talent. With services like leadership development, talent acquisition, and keynote speeches, we work with you and your teams to create talent solutions to business problems. To get started, visit talentwargroup.com. 
Join us next week for a new episode of the Jedberg Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you heard, give us a like and leave a review. Follow me, Fran Richopi, and the Talent War Group on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. And send your comments and inquiries to info at thetalentwar.com. As former members of Special Operations Forces, the Jedberg Podcast and the Talent War Group contribute a percentage of all profits to the Special Operations Warrior Foundation, supporting the families of our fallen warriors. Thanks for joining us on this episode. How you prepare today determines success tomorrow.